Now we're recording. Okay, so we're going to do a, a brief review here. We've been going for several weeks now in the Gospel of John. We're going to continue in John chapter 4, right where we left off. But I wanted to talk for just a second about last week's um, lesson. And mostly, I just wanted to ask, pop quiz, what do you remember from the last two weeks of lessons? I'm, and part of the reason why I'm asking is because there's been a little bit of a, a break. We, we took a two-week break because I went to the beach. Um, and I promise I, I read my Bible while I was there, but we didn't have class. So um, I'll go ahead and answer the easy questions. It was about the Samaritan woman at the well. So now you've got to answer the hard answers. What was that section really about? What was the big picture lessons that Jesus was trying to teach there? One was about the, the nature of the coming Messiah, the fact that it was him. Mm -hmm. um, and that salvation was coming, had arrived. Yeah, I who speak to you am he. That's how he put it to the Samaritan woman. She, she had talked about the Messiah, trying to get him off the topic of her sin, and he came right out and just told her, I am the Messiah. Very good. That's one of the big points of that section. What's another one? Um, for me, something that stood out so much was in the latter part of the chapter uh, when he says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and the harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. And then there's more after that. But um, really what he's talking about here is the people that are approaching from, you know, from far away. Um, and he's talking about, look, these people are people that you can, you know, talk to about me, talk to you about salvation. And, um, but you didn't do the hard work I did. Um, so anyway, I thought that was a really good um, part of that chapter. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, so I drew a little quick picture here. This is the town of Sychar. And this is my stick figure Samaritan woman who's walked off to town. And as she's coming back, like you said, here's the crowd following her. They heard her testimony and believed in Jesus as a result. And some were just curious. And she said, well, come and see. And they followed her. And Jesus tells his disciples, look up and look at the harvest. It's on its way. I began, I did the sowing, and now you get to participate in the reaping. And we're going to rejoice together in that. Um, and so... Some things to take away from that are, you know, sometimes this was a situation where the disciples, I don't think, were really looking to, to do any harvesting. You know, they, they walked into that situation not planning to do anything like that. Jesus shows up, sends them away so he can have a private conversation with a woman that shows up, and he turns a very temporal conversation just about water. Hey, I need, I need something to drink into a spiritual conversation about her sin and her need for a savior. And that blossoms into a larger harvest that the disciples could not have seen. Um, and, and it did so quickly. And, and sometimes conversions are like that. Sometimes, you know, you, you present the gospel and um, people turn around quick and bring their friends. And we see many examples, especially in the New Testament, where, uh, and we're going to see that today, um, where one man is saved or one woman is saved and they go tell their family, and it says their whole household now believes as a result. So that's good. So yeah, those are the two big points. It's, it's like I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, because either that or y'all take really good notes, because those were the two things that I was looking for, um, was that Jesus proclaimed in his own words to an individual that he was the Messiah, and then um, that the fields are, are, are white for harvest. You know, look up and participate in this. Um, and even though you weren't the sower, you could be the reaper or you can just be sort of a, a person who gardens. You might be somebody that just comes into that person's life and brings them a little further down that road. So we're going to continue today in John chapter four. And we're going to, we ended last week at verse 42, because I don't know about your Bible. Mine doesn't have another subheading until 46, but we're going to start at 43. These kind of go together, 43 through the end of the chapter. And it's not a very big story here, um, but there are some interesting things for us to note. So we'll just start by reading. Um, and there's 23 through 52. There's 10 through 54. There's like 11 verses here, 12 verses here. 
So maybe we'll read four verses each. So Matt, you're, you're first on my list, then Alyssa. So Matt, if you could read 43, and if you can count four verses across the paragraph there, divider. And then Alyssa, if you can just pick up whenever Matt stops talking and read four verses, and then I'll finish out the chapter. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. Um, I'll pick up. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that my, um, my Bible goes to a new line. And I didn't realize that that was a continuation <laughs> That's fine. of the verse. <laughs> Uh, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that, that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So if you'll remember when we started off um, this whole series on the Gospel of John, we talked about that John included seven, and some uh, theologians will say eight signs here in the Gospel of John. And the express purpose of these signs was to demonstrate for the readers of the Gospel that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, come into the world to save sinners. So um, here, we'll just pick up at, at verse 43. And this is one of those verses that's sort of like just a transition verse. Uh, the Gospels cover Jesus's life and the things he did. And part of what he did was he went to different places to do the things he did. So I, I'm going to keep drawing this map up here. Um, so who remembers, I'm, I'm just doing pop quiz style, who remembers what C this is that we're sort of dancing around? Uh, sea of Galilee. That's the Sea of Galilee. Then the Jordan River comes almost directly south out of it. Um, on the Jordan River was Bethany, where we started off our story with John the Baptist. We went up into Galilee for a time. The first um, sign was performed at Cana in Galilee not that far away is Capernaum. Both of those towns, um, Jesus went to earlier in this uh, gospel, but here they both show up in this one little story. So he goes down later to Jerusalem, that shows up in today's portion, and he was driven out of there by the Pharisees, and he went through Samaria, a mountainous region, to a town of Sychar. That's where we were studying last week. Um, nearby Sychar was Mount Gerizim that has the, the temple that the Samaritans worshipped on. So he, in verse 43, it says, after two days, he departed for Galilee. This was the two days that he had stayed in Sychar. Those who followed the woman out of the town of Sychar into the field to Jacob's well and said, um, told Jesus, please stay a while. We want to learn and know more. Now, I want to ask a question about his experience in Samaria. When Jesus was in Samaria, did he perform any signs as recorded here in the Gospel of John? Not that were recorded. Not that were recorded. We don't see that. You know, we don't see that he performed miracles and then they believed. What was the, the, the driving reason for the belief of the Samaritans? What, what was it that they said, and so we believe? The testimony of the woman. Right. The Samaritans believed on the testimony. Let's see. I'm going to erase this, this map here so I can write that note. 
don't forget the map. Take a mental snapshot. Um, the Samaritans believed the testimony. They weren't looking for signs and wonders. And that plays a direct contrast in the story that we're studying now. So it says he departed for Galilee. And remember, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. Um, Mary and Joseph took him down into Egypt to hide from the rulers at that time who were seeking to kill him. And then when it was safe to come back, they moved back. And he grew up in a town called Nazareth, which was in the region of Galilee. That's where he's going now. So Galilee is really sort of like his home state. It's, it's sort of like, you know, originally I'm from Texas. Um, you know, my kids and my wife, they were born here in Georgia. That's their home state. But Nazareth is just a city in that state or, or area. So here in, in verse 44, parenthetically, John says, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And that has always seemed really out of place to me. I mean, if you think about it geographically, here's, here's the region of Galilee, the seas over on this side, and we've got some towns in here, and here's Nazareth, and Right after this sentence, the very next sentence, it says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Well, now, wait a minute. Does he not get honor in his hometown, or does he get honor in his hometown? It's sort of like, did John mess up? Is this a typo? Like, I don't think so. We, we, I think that, that, you know, the Bible is true. There's no typos in here. There's no, there may be apparent conflicts that come out of our misunderstanding of things. Well, first I want us to get a little bit of context on this phrase. So here it says Jesus himself had testified, past tense, had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. This is not the only place this shows up in the New Testament, Jesus making this claim. One of those places is in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. So I want us to turn there to Matthew chapter 13 and read that and get a sense of what he's talking about when he says that. So let's turn, if you get to Malachi, you went too far. That's what I just did. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start reading in verse 53. Um, and Matt, I think it's your turn. Matt, you, you read Matt. Can you read 53 through, I'm going to move this bookmark so I don't lose my place in John. 53 through 58. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished, and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Very good. So this key question here that they ask, um, and we see them ask it in other places too. They say, is, is not this, uh, here it says the, the carpenter's son, other places it says Joseph's son. Um, I can't write today, Joseph's son. And so what they're, what they're sort of asking here is, this guy, he can perform miracles, he, he can exposit scripture, but we know this kid. I mean, I watched him grow up. Uh, aren't his brothers and sisters here in town? Can he really be the Messiah? This is a shortened account here in Matthew of um, what is included in another gospel that includes like him actually declaring he reads a, a part of Isaiah, some Messianic scripture, and sits down and says, that's about me. And they just lose it. I mean, to the point that they get so mad, they pick him up and try to throw him off a cliff outside of town. It wasn't his time to die yet, so he slips through the crowd and escapes. But there, there's sort of this like general proverb, and that's sort of what he's quoting here, that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. In other words, they're familiar with him. Now he's acting in a way that would others find uncommon or special, and they're just not seeing it. They, they think he's uh, maybe a charlatan. 
Uh, maybe down in the south, we would say he's getting a little too big for his britches. And, it, you know, that's what they're thinking in their mind. And so Jesus is making this claim. Flip back with me to John chapter 4. He's making this claim as he's going on this journey. Now, he's going to end up here in North Galilee. Um, and now I'm just going to stop redrawing this map. I'm going to only draw it once over here on the side because I've erased it three times now. Um, here in Galilee, there's, there's almost like a, there's not enough L's there. Galilee, there's almost like a, an invisible line here. Nazareth is in the south, and Cana is in the northern part of Galilee. And generally, in that day and age, when you said Galilee, he came to Galilee, frequently, regionally, they were referring to Upper Galilee, that northern portion of Galilee that Cana is in. And so when he says a, a prophet has no honor in his own hometown, um, he's talking specifically about Nazareth. And geographically, Samaria was down here. As he's coming along, he would have gone through Nazareth to get to Cana. He's just skipping that. And John here is skipping the account of what he did in Nazareth on the way to Cana. But it's likely that he went through there and performed few signs and miracles because of their unbelief. They just didn't believe that Joseph's son could be that guy. So here he comes to Cana, he comes to Galilee, and in verse 45 it says, the Galileans welcomed him. And what is the reason for their, uh, for their reception? I mean, in the, like in the King James, it says re they received him. Um, here in the ESV, it says welcomed him. What is the reason for their joyous welcome? They had seen what he had done in Jerusalem. They had seen what he had done in Jerusalem. You can tell I've been at the beach because I can't write anything on this board. <laughs> they had seen what he had done. So they've seen the signs and wonders that he did in Jerusalem because they were down there for the Passover too. Jesus didn't go alone. This was a big feast for the entire nation. They went down to Jerusalem. They had seen those signs and wonders, and now he's come back home, so to speak. In their minds, he's a countryman. Uh, this is a Galilean, and they're Galileans, and he did all those cool things. He cleared out the temple. He, he performed these signs and wonders, and now he has come home, so to speak, to them. Not really like his hometown, Nazareth, but to them, this is a big deal. So, Let's continue. He stays there for a few days, and he stays there long enough for somebody who's outside of Cana to travel now and meet him and make a request of him. That's where we're going to pick up at 46. So, uh, Alyssa, can you reread 46 and 47 for us? Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Very good. So he's come to Cana, and if we we'll remember correctly, this is where he turned the water into wine. And very few people were privy to that actual miracle, but it's highly likely that they went and told other people about it. Like the servants who filled up the water pots and then dipped the water out now become wine and took it then they would have told everybody about that trick. So they're aware of this. The city knows that he is a man who performs these signs and wonders. And so word spreads now outside of Cana over to Capernaum, a neighboring town. Um, and it's about a day and a half journey, I think, between those two. Um, it's, not a, it's not a short trip. It would have been sort of like an overnight walk. And the man who comes to see Jesus, it says, is an official. Um, in the Greek, I'm going to butcher it here, it's spelled like basilikos. Um, this official was a, um, a, a military and uh, political leader, and he would have reported to the person who would have been in charge of him was a man named Herod Antipas. He's one of the tetrarchs of Rome. A tetrarch is um, one of the, the four main rulers of Rome at that time. And 
Herod Antipas, those who lived in that region, would have, they would have called him king. And this man reports to this man that they call king. And so this was a very important person, this official who comes to see Jesus. Um, he has come to ask Jesus to perform a miracle for his son. His son has fallen ill, and he asks him to do what? What exactly does he ask Jesus to do? He begged him to come and heal his son. He begged him to come and heal his son. And I, and I want to make that point there because Jesus doesn't do that. And we read, we read just a few minutes ago what he actually does, and we're going to reread it again in a second. But while we're here, let's notice he asks him to come and heal his son, and Jesus doesn't come. Jesus does this for his own reasons. Um, and, and part of that we see described in the next few verses. But he asks him um, to come. Let's see if I can write a C. Come and heal. He wants Jesus to be physically present. In other words, come down and lay your hands on him. Um, come and, and, and do something similar to what we saw Elijah do, for example, when he, he laid out on top of the young man who had died and the life came back into him. You know, there's, there's sort of a touching that's required to do the healing. And that's what he's expecting of Jesus. And Jesus' response seems really callous on the surface. His response to this man in verse 48 is, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, wait a minute. This man didn't ask him for money. He didn't ask him for a show or a song and dance or any of those things. His son is on the point of death, and he will travel miles on foot to see a man he's never met in the hopes that he can come and cure his son. Uh, this, this, is not, this is not a please entertain me kind of guy. This is a man who is in deep need, has a deep need in his life that he can't do anything about. It's like when my own son was born with very large holes in his heart and I couldn't do anything to fix it personally. I had to rely on the medical skills that God had granted to some very talented surgeons and I, I was at their mercy. I mean, if something went wrong, I couldn't have done anything about it. And that's the position that this man is in. And he's come to Jesus, and Jesus gives him this answer that's sort of like, look, unless you see signs and wonders, you're just not going to believe, are you? Wow. That's not the response I bet that guy was expecting. Well, if we read that that, that sentence there. And Alyssa, your translation, I think, captures it better in English um, in the ESV. Why don't you read your response? What, what's Jesus' response in your translation there? In verse 48? In verse 48. Yeah, he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Right. So you, in verse 48, both times it says you in the ESV here and in the King James, I think it does the same thing. That is plural. This is a man who's come to make a request. There's probably other people around, and he uses the plural word you. He's talking generally to the people that are there. He's talking generally to Jews. Now, this man was likely a Jew who just worked in the political and military system under a Roman tetrarch. He's uh, likely not a Gentile, but he's talking there about his people, Jesus's people, the Jews, saying the trouble that you have in believing on my name is that all you're looking for all the time are signs and wonders. You're not really trusting in the things that I tell you when I tell them to you. And he's using the occasion of this man asking for a miracle as the time to teach this lesson. Now, this is, remember what we talked about the Samaritans in the story that we learned a couple of weeks ago, the Samaritans did not have this same struggle of belief like the Jews did. They want to see, the Jews want to see signs and wonders to believe. The Samaritans believed totally just based on the woman's testimony. And then when they meet Jesus and they listen to what he says, 
they put their faith and trust in him for their salvation. They believe because of the testimony. Their faith is simpler. It, it is, it's a trusting faith. It's a, it's, a, it's a turning to God and saying, sure, that's what I want. And here the Jews, they're looking, remember we, we sort of set up this, this paragraph with a paragraph before where it says they welcomed him because they saw what he had done in Jerusalem. In other words, we saw you do that down there. Why don't you come up here and do that too? So that's his response to the man. And um, in verse 49, the official says to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He, he says, Look, I'm, in, I'm hurting here. I need you to come and do something. I don't want to see a miracle. I want you to come before my child dies. And Jesus then says, Go. Your son will live. Did he actually do what the guy asked him to do? No. But did he heal the son? Yes. So we see here an example of many times in Scripture and in our own lives where we ask God to do something for us, which is good. We should do that because he's, I mean, that's the source of our help. Uh, God has the power. He created all things. But we go and we, we ask God for things, and he doesn't answer. Let's see, but he, he doesn't always, A, he doesn't always do them, but he doesn't always do them in the way that we expect or desired. Um, if I if I look back on things that I I needed help with from God, that is so frequently the case. And Jesus, even when he performs miracles in the New Testament accounts of the Gospels, every time, for example, he heals a blind man, he does it a different way. In other words, there's not like a, here's a one-size-fits-all way to heal a blind man. Um, and, and when he answers our prayers, that's not a one-size-fits-all solution either. Um, he has a special way to, to answer our prayers according to his grace. Here he does it for this man by just simply saying, go, your son will live. Now, what does that tell us about the power of Jesus by performing this sign? I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, but he, Jesus has the power. Like he doesn't need to be physically present. He doesn't, you know, he's the creator of the universe. He has the power to do things even remotely. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, the last time he performed a sign in Cana, he was, he was there. He was there when the water was turned into wine. He actually told them, go do this, go do that. He didn't touch the wine. He didn't say magic words over it. He would, but he was there. And here he's showing this man and the Jews in attendance um, who were watching that he has the power over sickness and health, and he can do that at a distance because he's omnipresent. He is the eternal logos. Uh, you know, they're looking at a man that exists in one place, and he's now showing to them that he has the power to do these miracles, even at a distance. Um, each of these signs points out something about his divine nature um, that proves that he is the Messiah. In the first sign, when he turns the water into wine, it's his power of transformation. It's a form of creation, and it, and it symbolizes the recreation power that he has. Here he has the power of healing, and not just like medical healing, but an obviously miraculous control over the human body and its health even at a distance. Um, that, that's what it's showing about his power. And so the man here, Jesus is sort of like recognizing generally that the Jews don't believe, um, that, that, that there's a level of unbelief there, that there's, it would be better for them to believe just based on the testimony. But elsewhere in scripture, you know, he's talking to them and he says, if you don't believe what I say, at least believe based on the signs that I do. 
And so that's part of why he continues to do these signs and miracles, so that they will believe. And here he's recognizing it and addressing it. And then he's given this man a challenge of faith. Because that man doesn't instantly know. He can't text his son or, you know, the guy who was taking care of his son and say, hey, is he better now? He's now got to leave and walk for many hours far away from this man he came to heal his son. And, and hopefully when he gets there, his son will be healed. He has to leave in faith, thinking that that might be true. And here in verse 50, it says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And so there's this, um, there's sort of like this teetering faith. I mean, he's got sort of that hopeful faith. He hopes that Jesus can do something. That's why he even came to Cana. And now given the challenge of go, your son will live, it says, he says, all right, I believe you. And he leaves and he sort of passes this test of faith, this challenge. He leaves, he, he believes the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And then we'll pick up in here in verse 51. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So now they've actually, he's on his way from Cana back to Capernaum, and his servants are meeting him on the way to give him the good news. Um, this, is, this is one of those things where um, the Bible says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The servants wanted to be that person. They, they want to be the bearer of good news this time. The master's going to want to know immediately that his son is healed. So they go to meet him. And he asks them. It's interesting here because he doesn't just say, great, let's go find him. He wants some confirmation. I'll write that on here. He wants this miracle to be confirmed. Um, he wants to know for sure that it was really Jesus who healed his son. I mean, for all he know, he, he knew he could have left Capernaum, and, and immediately his son started getting better. And then as he tarried a little bit in Cana, his servants were like, we better go get him because he needs to know he's better now. Don't bring somebody else. So it, instead he asks. And what does he ask to, get, to, to gather information about whether or not this was really a miracle of Christ? The time when he got better. He asks about the time. He's aware of when he asked Jesus, and when Jesus said, go, your son will live. He asks about the time of when he got better, and they said to him, yesterday, so we know that he's already been walking overnight. He's been traveling overnight to get back home. And he said, yesterday at the seventh hour. Now, we've looked at a couple of different times in the Gospel of John so far, so you've gotten a little hint at how the Jewish clock worked what does the seventh hour sort of translate to? Don't look at your Bible footnotes. That's cheating. One in the afternoon. One in the afternoon. How do you get that? Well, my Bible says one in the afternoon. Oh, and not man. <laughs> but, but it's not in the footnotes, so it wasn't cheating. Also that um, it starts at 6 a.m. It starts at 6 a.m., mm -hmm. yeah. So we, you know, we usually do 12 midnight to 12 noon. That's the Roman way of doing things. Um, but the Jews accounted time from sunrise, which is 6 a.m. Here's the sun coming up, uh, all the way to sundown. Uh, I'll draw it going down. Um, and that's 6 p.m. for us. So seven hours, you know, here's noon. Seven hours would have been 1 p.m. right there. So it, it was in, you know, it was 1 p.m. That's the point. Then the point was not that it was 1 p.m. That helps us to know like what time of day it was. And if he's been traveling overnight, he's probably almost back to Capernaum. And he knows in verse 53, it says, the father knew that that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. So this is confirmed to him. This was actually a miraculous healing at a distance. And all Jesus had to do was say the word. Now, What's the end result of this? Because every time we see Jesus heal somebody or perform a sign, there's this common end result that keeps coming up. And what is it here in this passage? It's belief. It's belief. Now, who believed? He himself and all his household. He himself and his whole household. Uh, Matt, can you just finish reading there to the end of the chapter? 
uh, the father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Good. The end result here is belief. They believed now that Jesus really was the Messiah. We're going to continue to see that pattern happen over and over. Something else that we see commonly in the New Testament is that when the head of the family, the father, turns and repents and follows Christ in belief, as the head of the family goes, so does the whole family. They end up as a spiritual leader leading their family into a better understanding and a knowledge of the gospel and the end result there. The Holy Spirit uses that to convert not just one person, but an entire household, which is amazing. To me, the, the grace of God in that is beautiful. That's wonderful. Um, that God uses families not just as a means of conveniently organizing us or uh, keeping peace or even, uh, you know, maintaining the sanctity of um, marriage between a man and a wife and all of the intimacy that goes on between that. But so often we see examples of God using families as a unit in the New Testament of conversion, that he will convert entire families, bring them into the spiritual family, so to speak, to make them all his children. And that's wonderful. That, that's something for me as a father. And if you are a, a mother, then you are also a leader in your household to act as spiritual leaders for your family, for your children, um, that, that we're called to do that, that, that we're called to, to teach these words, to open the Bible and let our kids read it with us so that they too can become believers. So that, this, that says this is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea into Galilee. We're going to see at least, as I was reading, I think it said we're going to see at least one more um, sign in Galilee next week. We're going to see um, Jesus heal somebody and get in trouble for it. Now, how many times did he do that? A lot. Um, but we're going to see a, a good example of it here. He's going to heal somebody, and somebody else is going to get mad that he did it. What do you know? So come back next week. We're going to, like we, we talked about it a little bit before the recording. Um, we're going to reschedule next Friday's call to Thursday because next Friday is Juneteenth. It's a company holiday. So uh, we'll just back it up a day, and whoever can come um, can come. And if you can't, then we'll miss you, and we'll see you again a different time. Do you all have any other thoughts or, or comments on, on this particular story? I just thought it was interesting um, that along the, the lines of Jesus not doing exactly what the man asked for, it's presented numerous times in the Bible as, as kind of the flip side. When God does exactly what someone asks for, it's typically a punishment. Um, mm -hmm. Like in Romans, God gave them over to their dishonorable passions. Uh, in Proverbs, a number of times, God gives people over to what they want as a way of either disciplining them. In the case of Israel uh, in the desert, there were a number of instances. Okay, you want meat? Here's meat. You're going to eat meat until it's coming out of your nostrils and a bunch of people die from it, um, which is obviously not the case here. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a reminder for us when we're praying, like you're saying, that to recognize that what we want is not necessarily what's good for us. Um, so, yeah, it's good. Yeah, two, th two thoughts there, now that you bring that up. Um, the first sign that we studied in the Gospel of John was turning the water into wine. That was to solve like an embarrassing social problem. His mom turns to him and says, <clears throat> they have no wine. And Jesus could have, I mean, there's no reason for her to think that he was going to do something miraculous. He could have just gotten up and walked out and bought wine and come back. Like, like that, that could have solved the problem but he takes opportunity to solve it in a way that's not what she asked for in a different way that she would not have expected. Um, the other thought there was that 
this man had a sick child and Jesus healed him. And the healing was a sign to prove something about Jesus' divine nature. But the child was allowed to get sick in order to perform this sign. This is not the only time that we're going to see that happen. You know, there's another time where um, uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking along the way, and there's a man crying out, Jesus healed me, and he's a blind man. And the disciples ask him a theological question, who sinned? in order that this man should be born blind, him or his parents. The idea that there was this retribution against their sin that caused him to be blind, and Jesus says, neither. He was born blind in order that the power of God might be shown through him, and then he heals him. And so a lot of times we see the things going on in our life that are terrible and awful, not noticing or recognizing, especially until later, that God's allowed that to happen in his sovereignty. He's ordained that it should happen in order to show his glory and to bring about what's best for us. So yeah, when you said, you know, it's not always what's best for us, that's what it made me think of that. You know, because a lot of times kids get sick, we get sick, um, and, and bad things happen, and God allows those to happen sometimes just to show his glory. Melissa, you're quiet. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Let's just pick it on you. Well, um, that's all I've got for today. So I'll cut off the recording and then we can pray and chat about whatever. But um, for all who watch this later, thanks for watching.